Good evening, everyone. We have two panelists tonight to discuss the idea of preparation for criminal trials. First, we have Clayton D. Campbell from the Bakersfield law firm of Campbell and Witten. Good evening, Clayton. Good evening. And we also have Hunter E. Starr from the Kern County uh, District Attorney's Office. Good evening, Hunter. Good evening, how are you? We're doing fine. Now, to begin with, we're going to ask them, instead of just introducing themselves, we're gonna start off with a question so you can get an idea what goes into preparation to be ready to try cases long before you ever get a case. So I'll start with you, Clayton. Briefly describe your legal training and experience that have prepared you to be where you are now in your career. Thank you, bud. Um, I started as a lawyer in 2002. I graduated from the uh, Oak Brook College of Law and Government Policy, which is in Fresno. I took the bar exam in February of 2002, was admitted later that year. I started out as, at a legal aid office uh, doing like unlawful detainer trials. So there were bench trials for eviction cases. Then I took a job working in uh, workers' compensation on the defense side. And then uh, I had always aspired to be a trial lawyer with jury trials. And so uh, I was not getting the experience I needed doing that. I opened my own practice in 2007. And I got on the uh, court appointment list in Kern County. It's called the Indigent Defense Panel or IDP. Uh, I was uh, then appointed and uh, on various criminal cases and got trial experience doing that. And then of course, attending uh, continuing legal education seminars. And uh, that's how I got the experience I have now. I, I started in 2013 uh, with my business partner, Jesse Witten. We started the firm Campbell Witten and that's where I'm at now. And Hunter, why don't you briefly describe your legal education and experience? It looks like maybe Hunter might have lost connection. So uh, we'll, we'll circle back to him when he, when he joins us. So uh, maybe, but if you wanna move on and uh, maybe ask Clayton another question and then we'll readmit Hunter when he pops back on. Sure. Uh, Clayton, roughly, how do you begin to plan for a trial when you first get a case? What's your rough start in planning? Well, the, uh, I always try to approach a case assuming that it will go to trial because if you can't work something out, then that is the default, uh, that, that is your destination. You will, <laughs> the case will somehow uh, be adjudicated without your, um, without your consent if you, don't, uh, if you don't actually work out a settlement. So I, I go into a case when I get it, looking at the evidence from the perspective of what will I do if this case goes to trial? And then I start to consider the strengths and weaknesses, gather information, uh, do our own investigation with private investigators, of course, review everything that the government provides us, including police reports, um, investigator reports from the district attorney's office, uh, any kind of media that would include body-worn camera footage, um, dash cam footage, those kind of things, surveillance cameras sometimes. Uh, once we gather all that information, then we would provide a client with their options, uh, give them kind of our uh, very frank assessment of the evidence, what we think would happen if we went to trial, and then we determine whether we should negotiate with the prosecution to try to get a settlement in the case or whether we want to press for trial. Of course, trial is risky, so uh, you have to uh, weigh all of those factors, and ultimately it's the client's decision. But I start at the very beginning of the case, considering how am I going to uh, explain this to a jury in a way that will uh, result in an acquittal? And is that even possible with this evidence? Now, we know that only about one out of every 20 felony cases winds up in trial. So how and when do you feel you have a good sense of whether or not it is going to go all the way to jury trial? And what do you consider in making that decision? Well, sometimes that decision is uh, taken away from us. Uh, <laughs> uh, if, the, if the prosecutor tells you there's no offer in this case, which happens sometimes, if, especially in a real serious case, uh, then it's going to trial. There's no other option uh, unless you know, the, the, the client uh, runs away to another country or, or dies unexpectedly. It's going to trial. So uh, that decision is not ours. It's also not my decision. Uh, on the defense side, we don't get to tell the client what to do. We, we give them advice. And usually a client will take my advice 
but not always. I've had plenty of cases, especially when I was doing court appointed cases where the clients would reject my advice. Uh, we would then reject a reasonable offer and then we would go to trial and then, uh, you know, then they would regret it later. So uh, that's a, it's hard to say, but if we have the, uh, the ability to have input on the outcome, in other words, we can uh, make a proposal of our own or we can accept an offer, then the, the, the uh, client has to weigh the pros and cons. So we have to give them options. So you say one out of 20, or it seems like a lot fewer than that from my perspective. And that may be because uh, getting privately retained clients, I have clients who usually are, in, are better situated to settle a case. In other words, they don't have a long record um, and they're usually the type of people that, uh, that the government would make an offer to. So uh, uh, how do I know when it will go to trial? Sometimes I don't know that until, you know, 10 days before the trial date, you know, the readiness or uh, right up until the moment of it. And for our audience, the readiness is the last chance you have to discuss with a judge before you actually get sent out to trial. That's right. And in in the way we do it in this county, and I think in most counties in the state, uh, there's a settlement conference of some kind, usually called a readiness, a trial readiness, and that's scheduled sometime prior to the actual trial date. And that's kind of a, a last opportunity to negotiate a settlement of the case. Now, of course, the case could settle at any point after that, but usually it doesn't. If, if you go past the readiness, it's, uh, it, that means you're planning to try the case. I have had cases where we settle the case after selecting a jury uh, or... <laughs> We get sent to a trial court and start the eliminate motions, and then uh, and then we end up settling the case. So it's but usually after that readiness, you know you're going. By the way, now, I, like Hunter is back with us now. In case you wanted to uh, get his okay. input, on. Hunter, are you there? Well, okay. we, we still can't get him. Well, let's let's go on with you, Clayton. Yeah, bye. He, he was muted. Hang on. Hang on one second, bud. He was there just we go. Okay, we got you now, Hunter. Yes, I apologize. My phone was uh, overheating earlier, and I guess it automatically muted me when I got back. <laughs> well, I want to then start at the beginning with you. Would you briefly describe your education and uh, training and also your experience that brought you to the point of your career where you are now? Sure. I would say the, the primary direction I took was actually long before undergrad. It was when I did mock trial in high school. I did one semester of it, and I realized I really liked the competitive nature of that mock trial. And so it was something that always kind of stuck with me, the idea of the competition in the courtroom. After graduating from undergrad with a bachelor's, I decided to go seek my doctorate at McGeorge, which is University of the Pacific that's located near downtown Sacramento. When I got into McGeorge, I didn't know what exactly I wanted to do, but I had a pretty good idea that it would be litigation heavy. I wanted to be in the courtroom. I tried out for the mock trial team. I was able to compete at the national level a couple of times, and that reaffirmed that I really did like trial advocacy, not just law, but specifically trial advocacy. When I was in law school, I tried a clinic that was appellate law. It was challenging. It was fun. It was interesting, but it was not trial advocacy. And so I liked it, but it really wasn't what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. When I got out, I clerked at a civil firm, very nice people, very nice firm, but they were not litigation heavy. And they told me they were going to be dropping off their litigation about nine to 10 months after I was hired if I wanted to stay with them. And at the same time, I was offered a job with the district attorney's office where you immediately get sent out to trials and you're just doing trials back to back. And when I did that, I found that I really did enjoy being in trial and taking over that courtroom and, and using it as an area to, to test myself. I really enjoyed it. Uh, tell me, uh, roughly, how do you begin to plan for a trial? At what stage when you get a case and how do you begin to plan for a trial? Well, I would say a lot of how you plan for a trial is going to be assessing the type of case you have. And the first, I'd say the first part of it is what type of case do you have? First, are you dealing with kind of a minor sort of misdemeanor type case or a more serious felony case? 
The second thought is what are your strengths and weaknesses? If you have a feeling like it's going to be a very difficult case, it's something you may want to settle, get the sure thing with the settlement, get some kind of plea, some kind of punishment, or at least uh, restitution for a victim, as opposed to taking it to trial and risking the defendant walking straight out without any punishment, no restitution or anything else. Then you'd, you'd consider the, the defendant themselves. If this is somebody who's, for instance, been tried and convicted of very serious crimes in the past or who has no record, that's going to give you an idea of whether this person is going to be comfortable settling. A lot of people who have never been in custody don't want to settle for custodial terms. They don't want to go into custody. That first dive is hard to make them want to go into custody. If it's somebody who spent a lot of their life behind bars, they may be more familiar with it, but you may be also less willing to settle the case. You may want them to go uh, away as long as possible. So a lot of these different considerations, and as I saw Mr. Campbell mention earlier, sometimes you're completely in control of whether it goes to trial by just refusing to negotiate, saying, no, this is the type of case and the type of criminal defendant who needs to go away for as long as possible. We're going to trial. There's no negotiation on this case. And the more serious cases you handle, the more likely that is to be your negotiation stance. I've done that a number of times where starting out from the get-go, I know I'm not going to make an offer on the case. And so I know right out of the gate, this is going to trial and I need to start preparing it as though I'm going to be in trial. In general, at what point and how do you determine if it's a kind of case that's definitely going to go to trial? Generally, I will look at that before the preliminary hearing, if it's the type of case where we go through preliminary hearing, which is the vast majority of cases. This requires you to look through the police reports, look through the evidence and assess the strengths and weaknesses in order to make an opening offer. At that stage, I will usually know whether I plan on making an offer or whether I think I'm going to be making an offer that a criminal defendant will take. A lot of consideration goes into that, in, including, frankly, the, the skill and tenacity of defense counsel. But usually I will know if something's going to settle or have a really good idea for whether I want it to settle before the preliminary hearing. Mm -hmm. Our Clayton, one of the important aspects of the beginning of a trial is of course selecting the jury. How much time do you spend before you're actually sent out to trial to prepare to select a jury? What do you do? Well, I want to get in front of the jury the bad facts as early as I possibly can. Uh, I know a lot of lawyers try to hide stuff because they're afraid of uh, influencing a jury. But I think if a juror is, is going to be swayed by just hearing some piece of information, then uh, your case must be pretty bad if that's what you're worried about. Um, I would rather get the information out there so we can talk about potential prejudices or biases that a juror might have or other things about them that might make them bad jurors for the case or good jurors uh, before we select them. Uh, if, if we're kind of dancing around some sensitive topic, um, then it doesn't come out on the table where we can discuss it in the jury selection. They're going to talk about it when they get back into deliberations. And that'll be, it'll be way too late to do anything about anybody's prejudices or biases. So the, the rules in California are actually pretty pretty liberal on, uh, on examination of jurors. Now, obviously you have to ask questions that are intended, well, maybe this isn't obvious, but the rules are questions have to be designed to elicit information that could reveal a bias or a prejudice or something about the juror that would make them not suitable for the case. It's not supposed to be an opportunity to educate the jury or to manipulate the jury or to precondition them, although a lot of attorneys try to do that. And I suppose there are some crossover questions. For example, you might ask about some difficult legal topic. And so you're, you're simultaneously educating the jury about that legal topic, but you're also trying to find out if the jury has a problem with it. For example, um, a defendant doesn't have to testify in a criminal trial. It's a Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate himself or herself. No one can call the defendant to testify without that defendant's consent. So uh, that might be an issue where a juror will automatically assume the guilt of a defendant if they don't testify. So you might have to 
educate the jury on the right not to testify and on the legal requirement that they still presume innocence, even if the defendant chooses not to testify. Um, so you're educating them on that, but you're also seeking to find out if they, they are going to have some kind of predisposition one way or the other. So uh, in preparation for, uh, for selecting the jury, that goes hand in hand with preparation for the trial in general. And that is knowing what the weak points are on the case so that I can hit them head on. And I, I don't want to, I, I, I try to defuse the bomb uh, before it goes off so that, uh, you know, if I sit there hiding a piece of information or not talking about some big issue, and then the first time they hear about it is in the prosecutor's opening statement or when a prosecutor calls a witness, then that may, it, then it's, it's this big revelation. I, I want to take all of the steam. I want to be like a, a movie preview from the 1970s where I tell you the whole plot of the movie before it even starts. I don't want to, I don't want to allow a big reveal that's going to dramatically um, convict my client. Now, Hunter, what do you do before you get to the courtroom to prepare to select a jury? Well, for one, I would say there's not a lot you can do regarding specific jurors because you don't get that information until you're in court. Mm -hmm. I would echo some of the sentiments of Mr. Campbell in that you have to know what it is about your case that you're going to have difficulty with. One of the things a prosecutor has to ensure is that jurors follow the law even when it seems kind of absurd. For instance, um, there's a, an instruction that says a burglary has been completed, that is somebody has crossed into somebody's house, even if they just put their, their fingertips inside of a window screen. Well, that's so counterintuitive to some people that they may just decide they don't want to follow that aspect of the law, even if our whole case is basically, we know they committed the burglary because we can put their fingertips inside that window screen at this time in this place. So one of the things we'll do is we'll have a number of scenarios or a series of questions that are designed to, to figure out, can a juror follow a principle of law that they personally find ridiculous? Some of this is uh, done in preparation, sit down, how can I talk about this type of concept? You shop these ideas with people you work with. What do you think about this type of question? What do you think about that type of question? One of the ones that we do a lot is people understanding what circumstantial evidence is. Most of people get their education about what trials should be from movies and television. So you'll say, <laughs> you'll, you'll have somebody on the witness stand who will say something and somebody will say, but that's not evidence. Well, no, it is evidence. Testimony is evidence. And so a lot of what we have to do is make sure that when the jurors go into the jury room, they're using the law and not stuff they got from TV. So you'll have these scenarios where you'll flesh out this idea of what circumstantial evidence is and how to follow it, or whether they can follow laws that even they themselves find to be absurd. This is cumulative, which is to say, the more times you do this, the better at doing it you will be, because every now and then a juror will, will ask you a question about your hypothetical scenario, or they'll give you an answer that you really hadn't expected. The more times that you do this and the more people that you talk to, the more you'll be able to kind of work with that in the moment. So I'd say a lot of preparation is actually cumulative as you move through your journey as, as a litigation attorney. Mm -hmm. Now, what one of the things that attorneys do early in the trial is present motions to the judge to determine how the trial will proceed. They're called in limine motions. Clayton, how much time and how much detail do you put into your in limine motions before you get to the judge? Well, it depends on the case and what the evidence is. Sometimes I have uh, some piece of evidence that will be difficult to get in. And, and this is where I think it's important to remind everyone uh, that the rules of evidence, although they seem like they're designed to make it difficult to prove a case, they're actually designed to limit the evidence to something that's fair and reliable. So if you remind yourself of that, then all of the evidence rules make a lot more sense, as opposed to just being an obstacle to getting your case in front of the jury. Um, but occasionally, when preparing for a case, I'll have some piece of information that may present a challenge uh, as far as getting it into the record and in front of the jury. And so if I, if that, if I anticipate that, I don't want to uh, give an opening statement where I tell the jury that this piece of evidence is going to be presented to them and then later have, an, have a problem getting it in because 
of some evidentiary rule. So in an, in an eliminate motion, I will add, if there's some piece of evidence like that, I will add a motion asking to pre-litigate that issue before we start the trial so that I know what the ruling will be in advance. And sometimes that, that, that and this, this happens on both sides where there'll be a piece of evidence where uh, one side or the other thinks that it should not come in or that we want it to come in. And so we'll bring that up and then we'll litigate that beforehand. So we kind of know what the ground rules are before the trial begins. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to uh, preparing the eliminate motions, it depends on the case. Sometimes I have cases where there are no such issues. Uh, usually there is something that we know is going to be an issue, even if it's not a, a real um, exciting one. But I have, I have a set of boilerplate um, in limine motions that I use in every case. Most of them are motions that are brought by both sides. Um, but if you don't ask, they're not granted. So you have to bring them up every time. And then there are some motions, you know, then I'll have things that I'll add or, or uh, uh, I might have to write a custom motion. For example, the last trial I did was actually against Hunter just a few weeks ago. And uh, he had, we had a very uh, interesting and novel issue where there was a witness in, uh, in Oregon who did not want to travel to California to testify in the trial. And he wanted to testify over Zoom. And I had a problem with that on, on uh, Sixth Amendment grounds. And so uh, I had to spend a lot of time researching and writing a motion that I had never had to bring before because I'd never been presented with a, a witness who was going to try to testify uh, remotely. And so uh, it turned out to be moot. The guy ended up uh, coming down anyway. So I never actually put <laughs> ruling on this motion, but I spent a lot of time writing it. And uh, but those are those are the kinds of things that you would have to, you know, just depending on the case and, and the situation, you might have to put more time and effort into it. And uh, like I said, half of them are maybe two thirds of them are motions that both sides bring, you know, for excluding witnesses from the courtroom, for example. Uh, everybody can agree that we don't want witnesses who are going to testify later to sit in and hear the evidence, you know, the testimony of the other witnesses. So we uh, we usually both bring that motion. Both sides will bring that motion to exclude witnesses and those kind of things. So uh, uh, it just depends on the circumstances of the case, but it goes hand in hand with the trial preparation. You should anticipate you're going to have an issue with a particular kind of evidence or, uh, or some piece of testimony or a document or something like that that you're trying to bring in. And you need to uh, prepare and, and hopefully get an answer from the court before you give your opening statement as to whether you'll be able to use that. Mm -hmm. Hunter, how much time do you spend and how much detail goes into your in limine motions? Well, I would say you're probably going to hear from both Mr. Campbell and I the, the phrase, it depends a lot, uh, this <laughs> evening, which is really the answer to every legal question. But in truth, in limiting motions for the prosecution are oftentimes about reacting to what we think the defense is going to do. Because we have the burden of proof, we need to be able to marshal and admit all the evidence that is going to prove our case beyond a reasonable doubt. Generally speaking, because even though the defense will often present a case, they don't have to present a case. And if they can keep us from presenting our case, then they win. Uh, we need to be able to anticipate the motions they're going to be making. And sometimes we can, we can ask ourselves, well, should I, should I just file a motion that is going to try to get this evidence in because I know they're going to be doing a motion to keep it out? Or should I kind of just keep this in my back pocket because maybe they won't make the motion or maybe they'll forget or maybe they won't see that it's an issue. But I still have that motion. I, I'll still have it briefed. I'll have it somewhere. So you want to spend uh, four or five hours at least going through your evidence and making sure that you've got every evidentiary issue tacked down. Even if it's not in your motions, you're ready to argue it. Over time, your experience will give you an idea of what judges are more likely to grant certain motions. For instance, one of the things that I like to do is ask that I get to prove all the priors, which are when people have been convicted of stuff in the past, like strikes, in the same trial that I prove their guilt. It's very, very common for these two things to be bifurcated and separated. I will usually make a motion that they be done together, knowing that I'm going to lose, but knowing now that the judge is thinking about it, okay, maybe there are reasons to do this together and the way the trial progresses, maybe I will put them together. And that has happened in which I was against somebody who decided to go pro per, which is without their attorney, they decided to represent themselves. And while he was on the stand, he just started talking about the times he'd been arrested or convicted. 
So I made a, I was able to make a motion right there that reflected the earlier motion, kind of harken back to it. I said, motion to unbifurcate. Didn't need to do the whole argument because it would all it had already been done at the beginning of trial and the judge granted it kind of on the fly because that's already in the record. We've already discussed the relevant factors. So I would say I'm going to look several hours of work into this, but I will point out Mr. Campbell's right when it comes to boilerplate motions. They seem useless, but the reality is, is everybody kind of gets one freebie. And if you don't want them to get the one freebie, you put it in a motion so that they don't get that one freebie where it comes out in front of the jury, and you object, then the judge says, yeah, yeah, don't do that again. Well, if you don't want it even once in front of the jury, put it in a motion in limine and the judge will usually deny it saying, well, that's just the law, but you're not going to do that, right, counsel? Now they don't get that freebie. So boilerplate motions are pretty important too, and you're probably going to have those in your motions as well. Yeah. Uh, what many people don't realize is when the judge instructs the jury on the law, the source of many of those instructions is research that the litigants did. Clayton, how much time do you spend preparing instructions, not at the end when you're actually discussing them with the judge, but before trial starts? Well, in criminal trials, generally, uh, I don't have, uh, I don't do a whole lot when it comes to preparing the instructions unless there's a special instruction I want. These jury instructions are generally standardized, and during the trial, we will have a conference. Generally, the prosecution will bring a packet of instructions, and then there are several of them. Most of them are required instructions where the, the matter will be reversed on appeal if the judge fails to give the instruction. So occasionally, we will have issues where there may be a lesser included offense that we want instructions on, and it's not necessarily mandatory. Some of the instructions for different defenses uh, depend on the evidence, and they depend sometimes on the theory that the defense chooses to use. So on those types of things, uh, to the extent that I have to reveal what my strategy is or what our theory of the case is, then I would I will discuss that with the court. But usually we're not required to have the uh, jury instructions uh, ironed out before the trial commences. It's usually sometime later on, and then the judge has a better idea of the evidence and it's pretty clear uh, later in the trial uh, what the, the defense theory is. So uh, the input from the defense, unless you have some kind of fine point of law that you, you need the jury instructed on or a lesser included offense or a, uh, a, a special affirmative defense, then um, we don't really have, we don't do a whole lot in advance. Now I will look at the jury instructions, uh, even if it's a, a type of offense that I've, uh, tried many times. I still look at the jury instructions and look at each element of the offense so that uh, to refresh my own recollection of the law as I look at the evidence. So then I look for uh, how was the prosecution going to prove this element um, from the jury instructions. So as far as the, uh, the preparation with the jury instructions, it mainly has to do with uh, comparing the evidence to the law as it will be presented to the jury and then uh, certain custom uh, uh, instructions if necessary or uh, requested instructions for lesser included offenses. Now, Hunter, the prosecutor usually has to bring a set of instructions early on. How much time does that take you and how much detail do you put into that? It takes me roughly an hour to assemble the instructions. This is usually gonna be done through some kind of software or program where you can select all the instructions you want, then go through and kind of tailor each one of them. Currently, we use Westlaw. Uh, through the Kern County District Attorney's Office, but that's by no means required. Other offices may use other software programs. I try to spend at least an hour doing it because as you're going through the list of instructions, you're reminded of the different instructions that a judge might not give without them being requested. For instance, uh, statements that are false by a criminal defendant, motive, there are certain things that you can get given to the jury so that you can argue them that a judge would not give on their own. As you're going through the list of instructions, deciding which instructions to suggest, you get to kind of replay the case over in your head and start to give yourself ideas. All right, what do I want to attack? What is the evidence that I really want to get before the jury so that I can argue it in closing? Pretty much everything you do as you're preparing a case is getting ready for your closing argument so that you can say, this is why this person is guilty of these crimes. When you're going through the jury instructions, you may find that there's some kind of um, 
problem with the charging. This has happened before where I'm going through what the law requires, going through the charge, and I realize we actually can't prove this case, this charge, because of what the law requires and what we have. And so you know beforehand, don't go into that case expecting to prove that, that charge. You may want to dismiss that early so that you're not wasting your time, the court's time, and the jury's time. So you want to spend at least an hour, a lot more time with the more complex cases, homicide cases with potential defenses start to become very jury instruction heavy. You're talking about something that can end up being 50 or 60 pages. You want to give it a lot more than just a single hour. Hmm. Now, uh, we know that you have reports that you read and we have sometimes prior testimony that you read, but Clayton, <clears throat> how much time? do you spend and do you do it very often to actually bring your witnesses in and have them tell the story so you can hear it in their own words? How often do you talk to your own witnesses? Well, it depends on who the witnesses are. Uh, sometimes the witnesses are not willing to talk to me directly. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes the witnesses will call a, a, a police officer, for example, sometimes as a witness uh, because we need this officer to provide the prior statement that contradicts what the witness testified to at trial, for example. So some of these witnesses, I don't know in advance that I'm going to have to call the witness. So uh, just as an example, let's say a, a, a witness who's identified in a police report gives a statement to an officer and that statement is helpful to me, or it may not be helpful to me or harmful, but they make a statement and the officer records that statement in the report. Later, that witness testifies at trial and says something that contradicts what they said previously. So now to impeach the credibility of that witness, I need to bring in their former statement. Uh, I can confront the witness himself or herself with the statement, and they may deny that they made the statement. And now I have to recall the officer to testify as to what's in the, the officer's report. So that's a witness that I may not even realize I'm going to need. Uh, it's an officer who testifies in the trial. Um, and, and the officers don't often uh, voluntarily speak to me in advance, unless it's somebody I ask know from uh, previous cases, uh, police officers generally don't uh, uh, give a lot of face time to defense attorneys um, in preparation for a case. So, uh, but if it's, an, if it's a civilian witness who's someone like I'm bringing in a witness, an alibi witness or something like that, I'll definitely meet with them and talk to them and, uh, and, and try to get their side of the story. But of course, I try to do that with an investigator. So I'm not making myself a witness um, as to what this other witness said. You always have to be ready in case the witness deviates from their previous statement when they get on the stand. Hunter, uh, how much time do you spend actually listening to your officers or other witnesses outside of court before you go to trial? Well, this question, there's actually different schools of thought from different prosecutors. Some say you've got to bring in even your civilians, really just listen to them and talk to them. Some people say, no, don't do that because invariably what happens is somebody will tell you something that's different than their previous statement, then you have just created a problem that was not there before. And when Mr. Campbell says you becoming a witness in your own case, that's, that's nothing to sneeze at. That's a serious issue because the rules of ethics generally frown on an attorney trying to be a witness in their own case. And that could create a conflict where Maybe an attorney disagrees with something that their own witness says. Now they've elicited the testimony, but they're the only person who can, who can say, well, that's not what you told me earlier. So it can create a, a number of problems that can be solved by having an investigator with you when you do that, when you listen to them, when you sit down. But there's another number of people who say, well, do you want to know about the change then? Or do you want to wait until trial to figure out that they've changed their story? So it just kind of depends on how you look at things and what your resources are being able to get an investigator in to talk to them. With regard to police officers, they're generally so well trained that if they're going to tell you something, it's going to be something that's either in their police report already or something that is not the type of thing that would necessarily need to be disclosed. Another consideration for me is that as a prosecutor, I have constitutional obligations of discovery that defense doesn't necessarily have. A lot of times if they don't know whether they're going to use a witness, which a lot of times before my case is over, they wouldn't know because they don't even know if I can prove my case yet. Uh, they, they don't have to turn it over. That's fairly common. 
with me, if a witness in a case says something to me, if it undermines my case at all, I'm going to have to turn it over. And if it's different from what they said before, I definitely have to turn it over. The increased discovery obligations cause it to be far more of, I'd say, a touchy subject or something that prosecutors take very seriously. I personally don't like to call the witnesses in to just talk to them and just listen to them and just hear them unless I've got an investigator and it's part of an investigation, which we could do in prison cases and such where the statute of limitations is not as much of an issue. We can go there with an investigator. We can sit down and personally do that initial report. So I, I myself don't really like to listen to my witnesses sit there and talk to them prior to the hearing. Okay. Now that idea of discovery, Clayton, uh, we know that discovery is generally what you provide to the other side or what you ask them to provide to you. Do you find any important tactical considerations in either receiving or providing discovery? Well, obviously you have to, you have to comply with the discovery rules. So if there's something that you have to produce, then it must be produced. There's no tactical consideration that goes into it. There are some times where I have material that I don't have to provide that may give us an advantage as far as say negotiating a, a deal. I've noticed something about uh, negotiating with prosecutors. Um, if I, you know, and I've seen this from a lot of attorneys, a lot of uh, especially new defense attorneys, they will read the police report and then they argue with the prosecutor about what that police report means. And the reality is there's somebody who's very uh, experienced at the DA's office who files these complaints. They don't just give that to the guy who just walked in the door. That's somebody who's been around a long time who actually reviewed the report and made a decision as to what charges need to be filed. So you're not going to convince the prosecutor that they just got it wrong, that they interpreted their own evidence wrong. So if I have something that sheds new light on the, on, on the situation, and I'm trying to negotiate a better uh, deal for a client, then there is a tactical consideration. I may not have to disclose something, but if I have a report from a witness that may help, then I definitely will disclose it uh, specifically to, to get a better deal for the client. I can think of only one case where I've actually looked at the evidence that DA already had and got a better deal. And that was because there was a, a surveillance video that I went through frame by frame and I know that the people that filed the case didn't have the time to do that. And I was able to discover a, a crucial um, piece of information that resulted in a misdemeanor for my client who was looking at several years in prison. He, he was guilty of a simple assault, but not of uh, what he was charged with. So it was a uh, uh, in that situation, it was a tactical decision. I could have saved that and waited for the jury and then revealed it to the jury in hopes of getting an acquittal. But um, it saved everybody a lot of time and saved my client a lot of risk. Um, by making that um, disclosure. So yes, there, the tactical decision would have to do with trying to position yourself for an, for an advantageous negotiation as opposed to you know, a surprise attack or ambush or something like that. Now, Hunter, I'm not gonna ask you about tactical considerations for discovery because you pretty much have to provide all you've got. But I do wanna ask you, Clayton, since you kind of brought it up when you talked about the surveillance video, there's so many more surveillance videos and people's cell phone videos now than there were before. How has that changed the work you have to do to prepare for trials and to eventually present the evidence? Well, it's created a lot of work because sometimes you'll get hours and hours of video and sometimes yeah. for multiple camera angles. So you've watched the same scene from two different directions at the same time. And, you know, and, and so you gotta watch, you can't watch them simultaneously, obviously. So that can be very time consuming, but it's definitely worth the effort because you'll find things in the video that nobody noticed before. And if you take the time and then you, you narrow it down and then you can go into a negotiation and say, hey, check out uh, this camera angle from, you know, for these 15 seconds, you'll see something very important. And uh, a lot of times what the police will do is they'll, they'll kind of fast forward till they, they find the, uh, the crucial moment and sometimes you've got to look back 15 minutes before and you see something that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And especially if the camera or the footage is not high quality, you might have to watch more of it to get the context. I've also got uh, some video um, and uh, graphic design experience. So I was, I've been able to, in many cases, synchronize footage from multiple camera angles to make it easier to show that to a DA or to a jury. And so that can help if you have some familiarity with it. Obviously, you're not supposed to, you, you know, you don't, you don't change it. You don't alter the evidence, but you, 
you might be able to synchronize two camera views and put them in the same frame so you can kind of see things uh, and you can pause it and get both frames at the same time. Um, and so that that's very helpful. But yeah, video and audio, uh, there, there's so much more information. Downloads of people's Facebook accounts, downloads of their other social media accounts can be massive amounts of data. Uh, I recently received a disc in a case that had somebody's Snapchat account and it was over 2,000 files or somewhere around 2,000. <laughs> and, and most of them were completely useless, but there were some uh, very important pieces in there, but you have to sift through all that and it can spend, it can take a lot of time, but it, yeah. it, it information that we wouldn't have had before. Hunter, briefly, is that the same experience you've had? It just takes a lot of time. Yes, the amount of work it takes to look through an eight hour video and find one crucial moment it, you, there's no fast way to do it. You just have to put in the man hours. And when you're getting six different camera angles over an eight hour period, you're trying to establish a conspiracy that took place during that eight hour period. It's going to take you just an incredible amount of work. And that's one case with the advent of body worn cameras, you know, you'll have 20 officers set up a perimeter uh, around an investigation and so you'll have to look at all those to make sure there's there's nothing on there that you could could use or, or need. And sometimes you'll get gold and sometimes it's just a whole lot of nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, I've only got time to ask you guys one more question. So here's what I'd like to close with. How much time do you use preparing your opening statement and your closing argument? And at what stage do you do that? Clayton? Uh, for the opening statement, I like to prepare that um, as far in advance as I can, but the final touches will be put on it after the eliminate rulings when I know the ground rules for the trial. There are some pieces of evidence that may not come in, so I can't you know, uh, promise that in the uh, opening statement. As far as the closing argument is concerned, uh, sometimes you don't have much time. It depends on the judge. So if the evidence closes and you, uh, there are some judges will make you start the closing arguments immediately. So you get your last witness off the stand at 3.30 in the afternoon, then the prosecutor is expected to get up there and give the argument. Uh, some judges will wait and they'll let you uh, do the closing arguments the next day, which is, which is really uh, a luxury to have a little more time. I've had multiple cases where I've had to uh, put together my closing argument over lunch because we're expected <laughs> to deliver the argument in the afternoon. So throughout the trial, what I'll do is as I'm taking notes of what happens, I'll I'll put on the side, a, 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 I'll make a little footnote about some issue that I want to mention in the closing argument, and then I circle it and highlight it. And then when I go back over my notes in preparation for the closing, I find all those little things that I may have forgotten about in that, you know, when I'm trying to put together my argument over lunch. And then I have certain things that I use in, in every case. And then, of course, everything, every case is different. So um, as much time as possible is all I could say for how much time to spend on the closing argument. If I have time, I'll sit and write it out and then, uh, and then deliver it later. And then sometimes I just have time to, to scroll out an outline over an hour. And Hunter, how about you? For op opening statement, unless somebody hands me a file says this just got sent to trial, go do the opening statement, I pretty much would never need to prepare an opening statement. When you're working with a case, you're going to learn the facts very early on and be able to summarize them. One of the things you don't really see outside of the career path is that inside the DA's office, we're all like right next to each other in little offices. And we talk to each other a lot about our cases. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? And so we all know our, our cases very well. And we are oftentimes repeating summaries of facts to each other. And then people will ask, well, what about this? What about that? So we'll know what, what seems important to people. By the time I get to trial, I'm able to summarize the case in five to six minutes, usually with great ease without needing to prepare anything just from memory. Uh, that, that's what I prefer to do. Depending on the case, you may hold some details back, wait for those to be more powerful later, or you may put it all on the table. I like to do it in story form as much as I can. So you kind of give the, the jury here the expectations for your case. But I'd say my, my preparation is not any different than my preparation to do anything else, reading the police report, putting on the preliminary hearing, writing motions in limine, getting an idea of what the case is. For closing argument, I work on it 
once the jury instructions are solid, you'll start a little bit before that you can cannibalize older closing arguments, but I do it in PowerPoint form because I have to go through all the law that the jury needs to follow. And that's usually a lot of law just on the substantive instructions about the crime. So generally what I found is for an ordinary case, I'll put eight hours into creating the PowerPoint itself. Sometimes I've spent as much as 16 hours creating the PowerPoint itself. And this is for like an hour long closing argument. The rebuttal, which is when I'm responding to the defense's closing argument, that has to be off the cuff. That's not something I'm able to prepare Although I am taking notes during their closing argument, I want to summarize it down to about four points that I respond to. So I would say in the more serious cases I've been handling recently, I'd say an average of about 10 to 12 hours for a closing argument PowerPoint. That's just for the, for the first part of my closing argument. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. We're going to turn it over to Dina in a minute to uh, supervise questions from the listeners. But I want to remind the listeners that uh, these attorneys are not going to give you any legal advice, so don't ask for it. And we'd prefer that you not ask them questions about specific cases they've either had in the past or are planning to try. Dina? Right. Thank you, Dean Starr. So I already have one question in the chat, and I'm I'm not sure who direct who to who to direct this to. I think it might go to Hunter. Um, but the question is, what uh, the issue about where a criminal is off criminal is offered immunity from a possible charge in return for their cooperation in in another case? Um, the the uh, attendee, the viewer, is confused on how or when that happens, or if it does happen. So. Um... A lot of times law enforcement agencies will do that prior to us ever becoming involved uh, because they're the ones who submit cases for filing and for review. So that, that happens and we just don't take part in it. When we have somebody who's charged with a crime, then they want to do some kind of agreement like that. We'll usually sit down with them and their attorney and then work out specific terms of the agreement. If we think that they have something to offer. Usually it's going to be testimony in the case that they are a part of. Um, it's going to be very fact specific regarding the type of case and how it works and whether they're getting a benefit. Movies and TV generally uh, show criminals kind of calling shots saying, well, you're gonna give me all this. Generally, that's not how it works. My most recent um, use of this somebody was going to end up getting like 20 years instead of 25 to life in exchange for significant amount of cooperation. There are, of course, those witnesses who come in and they're going to testify and they plead the fifth saying, actually, I could look bad. I could, you know, there may be something there. Well, we bring in an attorney. We don't let them do that in front of the jury. We bring in an attorney to advise them. Sometimes the defense can actually ask the court to compel us to give immunity if that witness is their only chance to put on a defense. Usually it's going to be limited immunity. It means we're not gonna use what you say up here against you, but that doesn't mean we can't prosecute you um, if we find other evidence about it. So it can get pretty tricky, but it's gonna be very case by case and it, there's no single formula for doing it. Great. Uh, another question is how how do you handle a gang expert witness? And do you ask for an opinion beforehand? Uh, for me? It, it just, I'm putting it out there, I guess, to either of you, if, if it if applies. I'll, I'll go ahead and start if that's okay, Mr. Campbell. Um, we don't just call an expert to the stand without knowing what they're going to say. I spent two years prosecuting gangs, and I can tell you that we had plenty of cases where we looked at the facts, we thought it was a gang case, so we added gang charges. We asked for an expert to be assigned. The expert got assigned. They looked at it. They came to us and said, we don't think this is a gang case. Well, so we dropped the charges. That's what we do when our experts say this is not a gang case. In fact, that, that happened in a recent case where I got it 
police said, we don't have enough evidence to say this is gang. We don't think the guy's a gangster. So I just went in and I dismissed the gang charges. Uh, if they have said that they think it's a gang case, usually they're going to give us what's called a workup, which means they've done significant amount of work where they're showing us the prior contacts that the person has had, where they've been, who they've been with. And we are going to usually have a peak at their criminal record as well, which will give us some direction in that regard. I don't think there's ever been a time when I've been taken off guard ever by an opinion regarding gang. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's how I would handle it. If the opinion is it's no gang, well, then, then we drop the charges right off the bat. And Clayton, does that apply to, to cases that you handle in any way? Yes, sometimes I do get gang cases, not, not as often as I used to when I did the court appointed cases, but the question sometimes is, is this person a member of a gang or um, is this witness qualified to give the opinion that the prosecutor wants him to give? So uh, sometimes we don't have really much to uh, argue with when it comes to the basis of the opinion, but some of these guys have long rap sheets, they've been arrested multiple times, Sometimes they've admitted to being gang members in the past, or they've been convicted of gang crime in the past, or they have the name of the gang tattooed on their face or something like that. And those are very difficult to, uh, to dispute. So what we go after sometimes is the qualifications of the expert to render the opinion that they provide. And sometimes, you know, not every witness is equally qualified. And at the uh, Bakersfield Police Department or the Kern County Sheriff's Office, you have some officers who have been doing this for a long time, and they're very qualified, and they're very polished. And then sometimes you'll get somebody that's uh, new to the gang unit and uh, and there are things that they don't know about and they haven't read very much. So you, you can go after uh, discrediting them and then setting it up so that when you bring in your own expert to offer a contrary opinion, your expert looks smarter by comparison. So uh, that is the, uh, it just depends on the on the situation, how you would approach it. But um, yeah, that's the, 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 it should, it's never a surprise what the expert, or shouldn't be a surprise what the expert tells you. Great, and I think we, we might have time for this one other question before we wrap it up. Um, the question is, what type of factors come in or considered when you're considering uh, filing a lesser charge or, or modifying a charge? So depending on the type of case, uh, we look at the specific facts that are involved. The nature of lesser charges is that, for instance, let's say, um, let's say assault with a deadly weapon and simple assault. The nature of a lesser included offense is that when you charge the assault with a deadly weapon, you have necessarily charged the simple assault. I myself do not charge lessers as separate crimes. That's really kind of a stylistic decision, I think, because they can't be convicted of both. So I just don't, I don't charge them that way. If there's going to be a lesser charge, it's going to be something that I consider as you know, what, what's the judge going to instruct the defense on? If I have charged the lesser, then we pretty much have to instruct on the lesser included, which I would prefer not to do in most cases if the defense is not asking for it. Although sometimes it's required, I think it, it does tend to confuse the jury and 3517, which is the calcrim that deals with it, is really kind of dense and hard to get through. So I don't charge it as a separate crime, I see it as already being charged and legally it is. So I actually have a question for the two panelists. What was your first trial that, you're, that you, you got to present? And um, uh-oh, I may have hit on something with Hunter. He's see him smiling. So if each of you don't mind answering that and, and if you wanna share the outcome of that experience, that would be great too. You want to go first, Hunter? Sure. It's uh, it, it, prosecutors start off doing the least serious cases possible, mostly because they don't want you messing up anything serious. So when I started off, I had the very serious case of somebody like speeding, but like in an exhibition of speed where they were racing somebody, and I hadn't really mastered the art of getting a jury to care about minor cases and then also managing a jury's expectations with what they would see. 
And so the facts were an officer pulls up to a light over at District in Gosford, right as these two cars take off, obviously racing each other. And those of you who are familiar with the Southwest, that's probably not too hard to believe. Well, one of them was really fast and got away and the guy who didn't get away got pulled over. It hung, uh, he claimed that he was not speeding and that the officer must have just heard another car speeding or something along those lines. When I spoke to the jury afterwards, they were asking questions like, why didn't the police take rubber samples from the asphalt where they said he was spinning his tires? And I was like, wow, you wanted to shut down district in Gosford to take rubber samples. I, I, I was blown away, but it did teach me a lot about managing a jury's expectations of, of what a case was going to be. And Clayton, your experience? Uh, when I got on the court appointment list, there were various tiers. So similar to Hunter's experience, when you first start out in criminal law on the court appointment panel, they don't give you anything. They don't give you like a murder defendant who's looking at life in prison. Uh, so I, I got all these misdemeanors and I couldn't get any misdemeanors to go to trial because we would get close and then the prosecutor would give a deal that the defendant couldn't reject. And so I had to have two trials in order to move up to the next level and get actual trial experience in doing felony cases. So there was a guy who was in custody for about five months on a case that if he had been convicted, he would have gone to drug rehab. It was just a simple drug possession case. And so uh, there was really no downside if we win or lose, he was getting out. So uh, they assigned the case to me. I went to trial and uh, actually got an acquittal. I told the, the judge ahead of time, look, I've never done this before. I've never picked a jury. So, uh, you, you know, please be patient with me. And uh, the judge told me exactly how, uh, how the jury selection process went. Uh, I had only experienced that myself previously as a juror. And so I didn't, uh, a prospective juror who was rejected. But um, that was the only experience I had with jury selection before that. So we picked the jury. We do the trial. It wasn't a terribly serious case. I, my client testified and uh, the jury acquitted him. And after that, I walked away thinking, well, this is easy. How, I don't understand why everybody thinks it's so difficult to be a criminal defense lawyer. Well, subsequent experience taught me that, you know, the more serious case, the more the jury cares and uh, the less likely they are to uh, to see a reasonable doubt. Let's put it that way. So it, it is it is very challenging. And especially when you get the more serious cases, you get the more experienced prosecutors. But that was my that was my first uh, first jury trial. Well, thank you both for sharing. Uh, we have students who are leaving because they need to attend class. Um, I again, at, on behalf of Dean Starr and the panelists, thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed it, and everyone take care and have a nice night.